Good morning, everybody. Okay, people that are sitting out in the front, I'm going to ask cars to honk just because I didn't have them honk last week and I think they missed it. So people out there, if you can hear me, give a friendly tap on the horn. Okay. So welcome to Drive-In at St. Mark's. Today in our summer sermon series, we are going to look at the sixth commandment, which is uh, you shall not commit adultery. And one of my favorite things is going to happen today, a baptism. We are going to baptize Tate Matthew Alexander today. So this morning, we worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, O Creator, O immensity of love, O eternity of mercy, come and be with us, and in us, and beside us, and over us. Be his hands upon us, and fashion us for shining. Be his warmth within us, and fire us for caring. Be his strength beside us, and shape our lives for healing. Abide in our prayers, the spoken and the unspoken, and make your word come true in our flesh. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Jesus said to me, Come to me, all you who are tired, who are worn out from carrying heavy burdens. Put down the heavy load you are carrying, and you will find rest for your souls. Let us confess our sins and repeat after me. I confess to Almighty God. I confess to Almighty God. That I have sinned. That I have sinned. Through my own fault. Through my own fault. In my thoughts. In my thoughts. In my words. And in my words. In what I have done. In what I have done. In what I have failed to do. In what I have failed to do. Forgive me. Forgive me. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Set me free. Set me free. From the sin that controls me. From the sin that controls me. Amen. People of God, know this. Our God is merciful and compassionate. Slow to, get, slow to get angry and filled with compassionate love. When you stumble, God is there to catch you. When you are weighed down, God is there to lift you up. So be at peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, lead us from death to life, from falsehood to truth. Lead us from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead us from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts, our world, our universe. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. <clears throat> now, this is what I love about having visitors. I'm going to teach everyone here how to do Pass the Peace in sign language. And then... I would like you to do it with me. And then after that, we also have honking because we need to get that peace out into the world. So this is how you do peace be with you in sign language. So it's peace. So do it with me. Peace. Be with. Guess what you is? You. And then also with you is this. So let's do this together. You ready, everyone? Peace be with you and also with you. And then everyone in your cars, let us share peace to those that are watching on YouTube and Facebook all over Nebraska, peace, people that are watching all over the U.S. and the world, and also to those that are listening on the FM radio here in Bloomfield. So share your peace out there. There's always one last honk. <laughs> always. So I have some readings for you that are connected with our th sermon theme. The sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. The first one is from 2 Samuel. It's the story of David and Bathsheba. And it's just the first part. When that time of year came around again, the anniversary of the Ammonite aggression, David dispatched Joab and his fighting men of Israel in full force 
to destroy the Ammonites for good. They lay siege to Rabbah, but David stayed in Jerusalem. One late afternoon, David got up from taking his nap and was strolling on the roof of the palace. From his vantage point on the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was stunningly beautiful. David sent to ask about her and was told, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam and wife of Uriah the Hittite. David sent his agents to get her. After he arrived, she arrived, he went to bed with her. Then she returned home. Before long, she realized she was pregnant. Later, she sent word to David, I'm pregnant. Our second reading is Psalm 51, and this is David's response to his actions. Generous in love, God give grace. Huge in mercy, wipe out my bad record. Record. Scrub away my guilt. Soak out my sins in your laundry. I know how bad I've been. My sins are staring me down. You're the one who I violated. And you've seen it all. Seen the full extent of my evil. You have all the facts before you. Whatever you decide about me is fair. I've been out of step with you for a long time. In the wrong since before I was born. What you're after is truth from the inside out. Enter me then, conceive a new true life. And our third reading is from the Gospel of John, the eighth chapter. Jesus went across to Mount Olives, but he was soon back in the temple again. Swarms of people came to him. He sat down and taught them. The religious scholars and Pharisees led in a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They stood her in plain sight of everyone and said, Teacher, This woman was caught red-handed in the act of adultery. Moses, in the law, gives orders to stone such persons. What do you say? They were trying to trap Jesus into saying something incriminating so they could bring charges against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger in the dirt. They kept at him, badgering him. He straightened up and said, The sinless one among you, go first. Throw the stone. Bending down again, he wrote some more in the dirt. Hearing that, they walked away one after another, beginning with the oldest. The woman was left alone. Jesus stood up and spoke to her. Woman, where are they? Does no one condemn you? No one, master. Neither do I, said Jesus. Go on your way. From now on, don't sin. Here ends our readings for today. So, once upon a time, there was a man named David. A man with an ordinary name like Mike, John, Steve. However, this man with an ordinary name was not an ordinary man. He was actually a king, a great king. And his story is this perfect rags-to-riches story. A boy who grew up in a farm, raised sheep with his father and brothers, and becomes a king. So one summer evening, King David was on his palace roof. You know those beautiful summer evenings? There's a soft breeze. Sun is starting to set. You can smell someone grilling. I love cool summer evenings. Anyway, I'm getting off subject here. David is walking on his rooftop and he's looking around over at the rooftops of nearby houses and buildings. And he sees a beautiful woman on this rooftop taking a bath. He knows he shouldn't look, but he doesn't stop. And then his hormones take over. He goes back into his palace and does some investigating and finds out the woman is Bathsheba, an unusual name for an unusual woman. David, being the king and getting whatever he wants, summons Bathsheba to the palace. You don't refuse the king. So she shows up. David seduces her. I'm not sure if it was consensual, but that's another Bible story that we can talk about another day. 
one thing leads to another. A few weeks later, she shows up at the palace and she says, I'm late. David says, no, you're not. You're right on time. She says, you idiot. I'm pregnant. And my husband, Uriah, has been away in the military and he's going to know he's not the father. David, being king, goes, what do I do? What do I do? So he puts in an order for Uriah to come home, take some time off with a little R&R with the wife, spend some quality time with her. Uriah hasn't seen his wife for a while. You know, one thing will lead to another, and then Bathsheba will say she's going to have a baby, and Uriah is going to think he's the father. No need to be on the Maury Povich show to do a paternity test, especially in front of a whole nation. But dang it, Uriah doesn't fall for this plot. Uriah does come home, but being a military man that he is, he doesn't want to violate a rule. If you're active in the military, no sex. So David spends the night with his troops instead. So you see how complicated this is starting to get? So what is David going to do? He's getting desperate at this point. Confess to Uriah? Nope. Put Bathsheba at risk because she's carrying David's child? Nope. He needs to get rid of Uriah. It's like a soap opera, right? One life to live in Jerusalem. So he needs to get rid of Uriah. Put him in the front lines of battle. He'll be the first to go. So he does it and the plot works. Uriah is killed. David marries Bathsheba. Oh, by the way, did you know David already had eight wives? He might have had more. Eight wives are actually mentioned in the Bible. So apparently he needed another. David thought he would get away with greed, coveting another person's spouse, adultery, maybe even non-consensual sex, lies, plotting to murder and murder. But this guy named Nathan shows up calls David out in his actions, and David realizes his sin against God and against against his community. The story of David and Bathsheba shows the ripple effect of one person's actions. David's selfish urges and misuse of his position in society had drastic effects on everyone around him. This is why we have the law, the commandments, to serve as a reminder of how we are to interact with God, with families, our neighbors, and people we do not know. And the law also shows us how we have fallen away from God's vision of community. And the good news, the gospel of God's love and forgiveness in Christ, saves us from our actions, which separated us from God and from each other like the adulterous woman about to be stoned in our gospel story, about to be stoned by the community, we are saved. Christ did not come to condemn. Christ comes to save. So David gets gobsmacked by Nathan. Have you ever heard that expression, gobsmacked? Your gob is your face. So it means he got hit in the face, smacked in the gob. David was smacked with the realization that he had betrayed God, betrayed God's love and trust. David's actions caused everything around him to spiral out of control. So what we have here is a paraphrase of Psalm 51. I read this a little earlier, but I did a little paraphrasing. Let me read it again. Generous in love, God have mercy on me. Wipe out my bad record. Scrub away my dirt, my guilt. Soak out my sins in your laundry. I know how awful I've been. My sins are staring me down. You are the one I've violated. And you've seen it all. You've seen the full extent of my evil. You have all the facts before you. Whatever you decide about me is fair. 
I've been out of step with you for such a long time. My guilt feels so immense. It, get back, it goes back to where before I was even alive. What you're after is truth from the inside out. Enter me then. Conceive a new life within me. God calls us to be in right relationship with each other. Just as we are to be in right relationship with God. So David's life story might have begun as this great rags to riches story, but we cannot forget he was human, just like you and me. And he messed up real bad. And he felt bone-crushing guilt because of all the things he had caused and done. He wanted to, to change his ways, turn his way back to God, to face love and mercy and grace of God. But he also needed to be released from his guilt in order to be truly free, just as the woman who was about to be stoned to death. So when you leave here today, live in God's love with each other, just as God lives in love with yourself. And never forget God's love for you. God's love is the greatest love that there is. Amen. Praise Him, praise Him, my little children. God is love, God is love. Praise Him, praise Him, my little children. Dear friends in Christ, God is love. God gives us life. We love God because God first loves us. In baptism, God declares that love. In Christ, God calls us to respond. One day when the apostles first preached the gospel of Christ's resurrection, Peter urged his hearers, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, and to all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord your God may call. So, do you hear the call to baptism? If you do, answer with, we do. Yes, we do. Parents. Parents, do you desire to have Tate baptized into Christ? If so, answer, we do. As you bring Tate to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with responsibilities to live with Tate among God's faithful people, to bring Tate to the world, word of God and the Holy Supper, to teach Tate the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, and place in Tate's hands the Holy Scriptures, and nurture Tate in faith and prayer so that he may learn to trust God proclaim Christ through word and deed and care for others and the world God made and to work for justice and peace. Do you promise to help Tate grow in the Christian faith and life? If so, answer, we do. Thank you. Sponsors, here's your part. Sponsors, do you promise to nurture Tate in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's spirit and to help them live in the covenant of baptism and in communion with the church? If so, answer, we do. Congregation, everyone that's assembled here today, people of God, those gathered here this morning, do you promise to support Tate and pray for him in his new life in Christ? If so, answer, we do. We do. 
Together with Tate, his parents and sponsors, I invite the entire assembly to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God, the powers of this world that rebel against God, the ways of sin that draw you from God? Answer by saying, I renounce them. I renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, God's, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Water's going to feel good. Oh, well, he'll be sleeping for a while. <laughs> holy God, holy and merciful, holy and mighty, you are the river of life. You are the everlasting wellspring. You are the fire of rebirth. Glory to you for oceans and lakes, for rivers and streams. Honor to you for cloud and rain, for dew and snow. Your waters are below us, around us, above us. Our life is born in you. You are the fountain of resurrection. Praise to you for your saving waters. Noah and the animals survived the flood. Hagar discovers your well. The Israelites escape through the sea and they drink from your gushing rock. Naaman washes his leprosy away and the Samaritan woman will never be thirsty again. At this font, holy God, we pray. Praise to you for the water of baptism and for your word that saves us in this water. Breathe your spirit unto all who are gathered here and into all creation. Illumine our days, enliven our bones, dry our tears, wash away the sin within us, and drown the evil around us. Satisfy all our thirst with your living water, Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You ready? Let's do it. Okay, you can put him right over the bowl. He's really quiet. Tate, Matthew, Alexander. Oops, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, Woo and in the Holy Spirit. Amen. We were talking about dunking babies when I met with them last week. I don't think he would have liked it too much. Yes. Tate, be sealed forever with the cross of Christ on your forehead and upon your heart and know that Christ is always with you and God always loves you. This is for you. Here, let me hold that. And receive this candle. This is a sign of Christ's love that is always with you too. So let us welcome Tate into the community here at St. Mark's with a round of applause. Okay, you may be seated. This is the table, not of the church, but of God. It is to be made ready for those who seek relationship with God. So come, 
come and make this journey. Those of you who have much faith, those of you who have little, those of you who have been here often and you who have not been for a long time, you who have tried to follow and you who have lost your way. So come and make this journey, not because I invite you, God invites you. It is God's desire that we gather here. Jesus Christ, who sat at our tables, now invites us to be guests at his. On the night of his betrayal, he sat at table with friends. He took a piece of bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his guests, saying, Take this bread and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. And after they finished eating, he took a cup of wine He gave thanks and passed it around for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new relationship with God made possible because of my death. This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Drink this, all of you, to remember me. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us in these gifts. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Be known to us in the breaking of bread and sharing the cup. We who are many are one body, for we all share in one bread and one cup. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, for those of you that are visiting today, know that the table is open. You're always welcome to commune with us here at St. Mark's. And we have pre-packed communion cups, COVID cups as I like to call them. So the way... This works if you are not familiar with this. The top layer is going to be clear plastic. Take that off, and that's where the wafer is. And then underneath is a purple layer. You take that off, and there's grape juice under there. And I ask that you hold on to these until everyone here has one, and then we will eat and drink together. And those of you, um, please discard these on your own. Don't throw them in the parking lot. So these are the gifts of God for the people of God. I need a glove.
And may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you, preserve you, and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your Spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And before I go on with the blessing, you will be able to greet and say hello to Tate on your way out. And also in the side of the church doors, there's the sign up for the community fair um, fair stand. So um, there's plenty of openings, so go take a look if you are able and willing to work at the fair this year. So receive the blessing. May the blessing of the God of Abraham and Sarah and of Jesus Christ, born of our sister Mary, and the Holy Spirit who broods over the world like a mother over her children be upon you and be with you forever. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.